job now? Oh, yeah. How are you doing? What do you do? Great. Moved in right next to you. Oh, yeah, where? Modern games. Now. Yeah. Up the Diablo Road. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just moved there in July. Every day's a holiday. It's where great. Shane. <laughs> uh, Shane. They, don't know, they don't know where I am. I'm <laughs> 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 up near Sacramento. Oh, I see. We don't work wearing shorts. Sell textbooks. Oh, you do? Taxi or is that shifted? Okay, textbooks. Apprentice Hall textbooks. I can't understand. Where did you go to law school? San Francisco Law School at night. Oh, did you? Yeah. And I also have a master's degree from the University of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Denver. Denver. What year did you get your uh, law degree there? Which the master's? Yeah. In 84. That's the chapel. And we're about ready to take a tour. Before we do that, we'll go around the courtyard. There's Bob Fox, who was my coach when I first entered here. What does it say, Greg? Heresy today, gone tomorrow. Heresy today, gone tomorrow. Dogma tomorrow. Dogma tomorrow. Dennis O'Brien. Class of 61 and their guests are invited to a special uh, buffet reception over here, uh, the college dining room, the old chapel. May I have your attention? I'm going to need some assistance. I see a couple too tall people here. Dennis O'Brien and Pat Brown. All I need to do is have you do that's Jim Postcamp over here, and he's from Talking Pillow. And, sir, I don't know your name. He's not going to tell me a thing. If somebody raises their hand, you make sure I see them because I'm shorter than you two are. Your most memorable moment in the seminary. Would you speak clearly? <laughs> Is that my fault? Is that my fault? By the time we go all the way around to Ed Gaffney, I'll have thought of something. Mm, put it in the ball, huh? <laughs> the right hand. You're on the left hand. Come on, Greggy. I'm a much senior. <laughs> Jim 
Pulse Camp. Uh, I spent most of my priesthood at Hannah Boy Center playing Father Flanagan of the West. <laughs> Two years ago, I was switched to the central office in Santa Rosa, where I'm chancellor. My most memorable experience, I guess is what I said on impulse, it was getting out. <laughs> Get the camera off me, Paul. <laughs> I'm Jack O'Shea, in case you don't remember, and uh, <laughs> face the camera. <laughs> we got your My last right, 20 yeah. years, is it 21 years? How many years? 25. 25. 25. Has been living up on the Crystal Springs Lakes that some of you have come down. Yeah. You spent some time now? there, right? Like Al. I did. I think my most memorable experience has always been remembering uh, my father. <laughs> Real Moser would say, you get three for the Trinity, because I always got zero on all those ten points uh, <laughs> that we always had, right? And I think I also had probably the most uh, retakes of anybody in the history of this <laughs> That's my, my memory that I can add. And a great jump class. shot. What's a retake? Oh, What's a retake? No, right? Name, <laughs> hey, boy, hey. hey, boy, hey. I just remembered a memorable experience. I was... <laughs> My last year here, I was Cassius Nincompoopus in the minstrel show. And that was a real big Did thing for me. The yeah. I remember that. They stabbed Caesar yes. in the they rotunda. Was yes. Where? In, in the, the rotunda. rotunda. <laughs> Not there. study hall, perhaps my most memorable occasion was, I didn't do it, but someone had the bright idea of when the, uh, when Vic O'Neill was walking back and forth at the back of the study hall reading his briefery, uh, putting a sign at one end of the study hall saying, a look at the deer tracks on the ceiling. <laughs> I remember because it's being winking back, I was in the last row, he, he looked at the deer tracks on the ceiling. <laughs> you, you had to be there to read <laughs>
Because I would return on delinquents. I got my train to here saying no. Memorable moment, I have three of them. One was an earthquake in 1955 when I was in the study hall. The, one of the largest earthquakes I thought. I remember that one. Another one was working with Ed Sarsfield, learning how to dig out the side and leave it in your, in your locker. And you can make, you make booze out of it. You get all cloudy. You drink it now. You drink it and get sick. Yeah, it was the worst. And another one was Father Doyle told me. It was in June of my first year. He says, be careful. There are a lot of young girls out here. You could really get in trouble. Right? I didn't think about it until he told me that. I did. I went out and I just I never seen that. <laughs> I followed my dreams of life. I'm still a joke. I'm married the second time. I have five kids. And I never, you know, Doyle was right. <laughs> Yes, 
Short, McAllister. You got a reputation. At first, it's my first memory. I came in as a non-original uh, Catholic, so I was late. And I have uh, shut up. Win, 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 win. Not a rich. Not a rich. Not a rich. So I come in and I have these incredible lofty ideals generated by people far removed from the seminary, and I get in there. And I'm seated next to McLaughlin, right? <laughs> and, uh, so I'm trying to catch up with all these heavy minds in this class, you know, because I, I, they've told me, God, you just barely got into the seminary, and you know, you're really lucky because they don't let people in after, you know, unless you know how they So I, I keep looking over to see what to do, and this guy next to me has this little book. And he keeps opening it up during every study hall, no matter what we were studying. He had this little book, you know, and I kept looking over, you know, trying not to be too uh, obnoxious. Finally, I, I catch a glimpse of it because he was talking to somebody. The prophet turned his back and started. And I look over, and it's a Trojan record book. <laughs> all these little numbers written down. And he did it every day. Well, this, you know, and... Bob Homer, huh? It's like Homer. <laughs> that was my first, my first recollection of the seminary, and I kind of got, I was real serious about it, and then uh, gradually I met Pat because we're both Indians. He took me on a walk and explained to me that basically the uh, the law of survival in the seminary, you know, is as it goes, you know, just kind of walk around like this and tell you what's going on. <laughs> you know, and you kind of go. And, uh, so he explained things to me, and uh, <laughs> I was a win. Was gonna be a win. Good time he was, end, though. He was when you first got into the seminary, you know, coming in from high school, you got to go play sports, you know, and you know you're playing sports, and then the walking walks up, and he's got a clipboard, you know, and I remember him walking up and seeing that uh, you were playing sports in high school. So, <laughs> yeah, I played a little bit, but I, uh, I got I got sick in high school. Sick? What do you mean? Sick? <laughs> Are up. O'Brien, O'Brien, Ramblers, shit, I'm playing goalie. What's <laughs> <laughs> me at goalie? What's me at goalie? I don't know how to play soccer. I've never played soccer. Uh, O'Brien's cruising down there. McLaughlin, I saw him sneaking cardboard under his socks. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Please. You know? And anyway, I'm telling Nancy, the biggest thing that scared me about this thing is I wouldn't have the time to, to soak up everything my heart feels about this place. I mean, I wake up at night thinking, God, I'm getting, 
I'm getting old enough, I might die before I get back to these guys. And they're some of the tightest connections I have. And it really, it scares me getting old, you know. I love you guys, man. I love you guys. Who's going to be around? I won't be there, Paul. Give it to the FBI. I'm Pat Brown. I'm hey, Pat no, Father Brown. I'm not a Mount Senior. <laughs> It'll come, Pat. Hang in there, boy. <laughs> hey, me that red looks good. I don't know red buttons up and down. Huh? <laughs> I bought one doesn't even fit. <laughs> Too big. It's your turn. I spend more time here than anybody else. You got a diploma? Six years. And three years as a faculty member. And I think the, the most memorable occasion was as a faculty member. Because Father Middlemoser was at St. Anne's home. And he was going senile at the end. And I was saying, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which end? What about in the middle? Which end? Yeah, which end? And the little sister of the floor came up to me and said, Father, it's just impossible for us to be able to deal with Father Bilbo's and we'd like to send him to Presbyterian So I went in to talk to him, and I said, Father, the sisters feel that it would be better for you to move to another facility, and I just want you to understand what's involved here. And he said, well, you're not going to send me there. And I said, Father, you give me nothing, I give you nothing. <laughs> Yeah. 
chaplain of the Newman Center at San Jose State. And uh, that itself is memorable. Uh, the only thing I have to do is be careful not to look at the years in which students were born. Because uh, none of them were born by the time we left Newman. I came in after Sarah High School, so four years of that. And um, my most memorable memories of, of St. Joseph's, those that, that I, you know, that I haven't suppressed. Um, there are two, really. There are two. One is the, is the time that I was sitting in apologetic class. Remember that? Uh, with Beak O'Neill. And I was reading for the class. And he started in on this explanation of how we were to read. And he did it with his entire body. And um, I remember looking up at him thinking he's got to be putting me on. <laughs> and realizing but with horror that he was not. <laughs> that was the first one. The second one at, at St. Joe's was, um, I got sick in my poet year, but um, since you had to be practically dead before you went to the infirmary, um, I went to class and everything else. And so I was sitting at the table, at the end of the table, and the mystery was right in front of me. And Al Potter was right across from me. And let's just say I'll never forget the look on Al Potter's face. <laughs> At St. Patrick's, the most memorable thing had to do with, uh, with Greg McAllister. And that is, in addition to knocking over my bookcase, <laughs> one night he stole my door. <laughs> what to do because the pins were still gone. And Father Red Ed Cronin comes down. And, and he just looks at us and says, okay, talk. I was a rather speechless. Ken Kelser started to say, we're putting the door back. And he said, obviously. So finally he mellowed out a little bit suggested I just kind of lean it there. <laughs> and, and it was it was as he was walking down that, that we heard this crash in a room across the hall. And it, it turned out to be Pat Brown, in passive, on chair, looking through the transom, <laughs> who was so unnerved at the sight of Father Cronin uh, that he fell off his chair. <laughs> And roll out the bed. <laughs> but uh, I suppose the second most memorable moment, though, is that um, afterwards, since I consider that a challenge to Greg McAllister, um, knowing his laundry number, I still remember, you probably forget. Um, I just picked up his laundry out of his hands after, <laughs> after he turned it in, took it and kept it in my room for a week and then gave it back. And, um, I had Ken Kelsa write the note that said, um, <laughs> and it said, Dear Mr. One Sub Before, if you wish your laundry is done next week, please deposit them on time. We wanted to do you the favor, but the authority says no. And sign his sister sons. And that, was, that was my greatest triumph in my in this life. <laughs> Listening to all these stories, I thought, I can't remember any stories. I don't remember anything. 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 There were some real good things. I remember um, Father Realmoser seemed to me the nutsiest. And he, he used to call someone here Button. I, I can't remember who it was. But he used to always come say, OK, yeah, it's Button. It used to go like that. Go up. It was Stephen Price. Stephen Spatz. Hey, Button Man. <laughs>
years. And uh, <clears throat> then we had him in senior year in history. Yeah. And we thought, oh, now he's going to be a lot more together. He'll be more <laughs> real with us. Uh, and he, but he had a technique where he would go on and on and on and on. And we would be falling asleep as he was talking. He was talking yeah. about Hitler. And it was described the facts of his life and what he did to Germany and the world. And then he reached a point and he said, the man was crazy. Don't you understand? The man was crazy. <laughs>
Pat Brown had a pitcher's glove that was about this long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little hand, a little finger yeah. that was long, but it had a brown <laughs> After about, he laughed about a third of an inning. He's going to walk everybody or hit everybody. And uh, did everybody cheer when he went out? Did they talk about right here? Oh, yeah. He got all the help because he has this side all the way. Oh, 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 all I can remember playing soccer, feet of his were just, he'd whack that ball yeah. with his size 15. <laughs> and then, and I thought, Donna Suna was our coach. And Donna Suna was about six years, and he was a good coach. And he had these, I don't know where he got them, must have gotten from Bolivia or something. Like leather, <laughs> leather shoes with the leather studs and all that. Oh man, every Christmas, that's all I wanted was these soccer shoes with leather, leather shoes. I never got them, though. No. <laughs>
things that I was thinking about, Dennis, of course, the thanksgiving story, I scratched that one right off. Uh, the other I was thinking about, uh, these are things that I'm kind of like disclosing. You mentioned marriage encounter, you know, S. You know, so I feel like I'm an S right now. Uh, I don't know what my ranking was in the class, but you know, I got I got to cop out to you. There was no scheme involved with tests. Okay, and we had older brothers. Exams were handed back to students. And I think there are certain ones like uh, physics, I forget what Or just history. Yeah. No, I know. Whatever they were, there are certain ones that were handed out. Well, there was a, a group of people, kind of like the, the mob or the mafia, you know, <laughs> that were sworn to secrecy, which are brothers apart, uh, that what they would do is they'd look at a good student. I won't tell you, you know, he looks better students in the class. Where all of a sudden that guy's <coughs> test was missing. The teacher would count the test stuff. I said, where's your test? Go to Pat. Go, Pat, did you keep your test? Oh, I didn't keep my test. Anyway, there was a group. That we had test points way back many, many years. Some of you, of course, knew that. Uh, no. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the way Father Cronin, that was physics, I guess, Father Cronin. There's only so many ways you can, I guess, give a physics. The, the other one I was thinking about is Al Potter. You might remember Al Potter. There was a, a thing, if you went behind the, the books, they called the books in the study hall. The, the sophomores with geometry had this compass, and they would jab you with the compass. <laughs> and Al Potter, one time, it was, uh, we had like an evening study, and we were going over to say the rosary. And we're kneeling there, and I forget, I wasn't right next to him, but I remember kneeling next to him, and he was going, oh, I'm really hurt, he says, that Austin Holy, and I think I remember it was, and I drink over, rock over, whatever guy's name was, and there's tough guys there. Mike Rocco, he says, he really got me, you know. He says, you really got me, but I'm not going to let him know it hurts. I look back, and there was the compass. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
to the middle of, uh, I guess, 57, quit, not knowing how close I was to becoming Pope. <laughs> but uh, people who have not <laughs> next up, uh, the people who have not served time here really don't know what the whole meaning of this place is. You have nicknames, names uh, for the faculty, people that uh, devoted their whole life to trying to teach the incompetent in many cases. And they, uh, they had a nickname as soon as they walked in, like Father Riddle Moser was Joe, Father Heller was Buffalo Bob, and Beansy Campbell. And uh, one time I remember is uh, in uh, freshman English, uh, Father Heller was trying to teach. And uh, we had the beloved Al Potter in that class also who knew how to antagonize. And Father Heller looks at him and says, damn it, anyway, Potter, you're making me vulgar. <laughs> and with that thought, uh, uh, my recollection of uh, the people that are not here, the Bill O'Briens, the Chuck Barados, the John Cunningham, is really fantastic. Uh, not having been in this building since the day I walked out, uh, the individual literally why? Well, that's the secret. But uh, we literally walked out. Uh, no, it wasn't in the middle of the night. We were uh, on a class walk that day, and uh, it was in October, and I had a ingrown toenail at the time, and uh, Tom Malkin was under detention for some reason or another. And he was pretty well teed off at the whole factory. <laughs> Potter and I, we went on the class walk. And uh, when we came back, uh, our team decided to escape, I guess. And uh, we kept on walking. And I think that was the last time I was in this building. And it is really a pleasure to come back, seeing the faces of that uh, we lived with for almost three years. And you're with these people 24 hours a day, which is comparable to being with somebody a normal high school cycle probably for about 20 years. And uh, it's amazing. But the thing that I really recall is the time Bob Saba caught the football. <laughs> that, that, that is the classic. And I'm sure he'll relate that story. And that stands out the most. I've worked for Southern Pacific for 27 years, lived within five miles from where I grew up, so uh, it, it is really a pleasure to come back and see everybody, meet the uh, people that came in a little later, and knowing that we set the groundwork for whatever went on here. But, uh, again, I'd like to thank the members of the committee that kept sending me letters to help, and uh, seeing everybody again, it's really a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> well, obviously my name is Bob Saber. I live in San Francisco, and I work at Hot Work, and I do a good job of it. And uh, I've got a lot of fond memories of my year and a half going to school here. Uh, I can still see Father Webster walking into the courtroom. I should say, I'm going to the And the facts and the and during the winter months, going down to the Grotto and trying to salvage the Stations of the Cross. One of the funniest stories was a story I heard about somebody taking a big pane of glass and sneaking into Beansy's room, Father Campbell's room, and putting it under the toilet seat. <laughs> <laughs> He had his back turned, he didn't hear or see anything. And I stood up and 
caught the football. And just as I caught the ball, Father Campbell comes walking. Not Campbell, but Campbell comes walking. <laughs> and he comes all the way to the back, right to my desk, and he says, Father Campbell would like to talk to you. So I go up and see Father Campbell, and he says, you have a choice. He says, you can either leave, or you're, we'll kick you out. That's it. That's <laughs> <laughs> my last memory. <laughs> high school with very little of that, so uh, they put me back to fourth high. So uh, I had Father Riddle Moser twice for U.S. history and, <laughs> and Persia Latin. I got to listen to his stories about his years on the B&O twice. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was fourth high religion with uh, Father Rock, good old Father Rock. Remember my first day in there? It came my turn to read my paragraph in the book, and uh, I don't know how I had read or what I had read, but he says, uh, son, you're from the Mission District, aren't you? It was the first time I realized that I had any kind of an accent or cultural thing for San Francisco. <laughs> but uh, another memory I have here, uh, a very fond, good memory, but it also was the most mis miserable, I think time, I think. Yeah. I can remember those two o'clock vespers in the chapel in the spring with the <laughs> sun pouring in. <laughs> you can hardly keep your eyes open sometimes. But it was good, to, uh, very good getting back to seeing everybody. And uh, I want to thank the committee, too, for the work they've done to get us together tonight. Probably one of the one of the few people here who's got a different name now. Uh, not because of uh, because I wanted to change it necessarily, but uh, all of you know me as Chuck. Uh, now most people know me as Vincent because I'm a Benedictine, and the year after I left St. Joseph's after uh, first year college, I entered a Benedictine monastery, and not by choice we change our names. So I'm now Vincent. Uh, been a Benedictine for 25 years in Oregon, and I extend at this time a cordial invitation to all of you, if you're in, any of you, if you're ever up in the north, to stop by and, and visit. We have fine guest facilities. Some of you know, some of you have been out and visited. For about uh, 20 years, I was uh, I was a non-ordained Benedictine monk, and about four <coughs> years ago, I finally decided to take some of my uh, advice seriously, advice that I had given my students in the seminary for years, and that was to uh, uh, do some serious considering about this thing called priesthood. And so that's how come uh, I uh, ultimately was ordained a few years ago. Uh, in my work, I probably, I like Pat, <clears throat> I've done a lot of seminary work. Uh, ironically, <laughs> the very reason I left here was because I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, <laughs> Seriously, I remember uh, telling Ralph uh, Weimer that uh, the night before I left, that I can't take it anymore, I'm leaving tomorrow. And uh, so there had been a rash of exits uh, at that particular time. <laughs> I remember uh, several fellows leaving and, and uh, just deciding to go. And, and uh, all of a sudden, I, I, two years later, I find myself uh, in a strange land and doing the same kind of work that I wanted to get out of. So. Uh, <laughs> Probably my most memorable time uh, uh, thoughts of, uh, of uh, St. Joseph's uh, come back to haunt me in a sense because uh, they became, the, the total experience that became my basic training for my novitiate. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you know much about novitiates, but uh, sometimes they can be kind of grueling. Uh, mine was a a three. I had no problem because I considered my uh, whole period here basic training. <laughs> and, <laughs> so any kind of monastic routine was a snap after this. Uh, other than that, um, there probably is a classical uh, happening that is one of my fondest memories. That is living up in the uh, what was then a new wing in our fourth year of high school, and uh, there was this cat roaming around the hallways. 
I don't know if you remember the cat. Uh, Ed probably does. And so does Tom Sheehan, I think. Uh, but uh, I lived across the hall from Maurice, and uh, we were all playing with this kitty at night. You know, Nobody realized that the cat was pregnant. Uh, <laughs> nobody realized. But, you know, anyhow, <laughs> if you recall, we had to be in bed. We had lights out at 9.30. And uh, the prefect would roam around and check to make sure no lights were on, right? Well, uh, this was even in college. Well, Maurice wasn't sleepy that night. He just decided he'd keep the cat company. Right, Maurice? Huh? Remember that? Cat can stay in his room tonight. Well, he made it a nice little bed in his desk drawer. He had his socks or something. And in the middle of the night, he woke up to these strange sounds. And lo and behold, he had company. <laughs> How many kittens were there, Maurice? Oh, <laughs> there were a bunch. And then the whole school, our whole class was, I don't know if you remember, but uh, we were sneaking milk out. And, and we couldn't take anything out of this dining room. Sneaking food out of this dining room to feed this cat. And what are we going to do with it? And I think Tom Sheehan had the keys that year, in our senior year. And he says, I got the perfect place for it. He took it up to the bell tower to, to the uh, storage uh, room where, where the faculty kept their luggage. And uh, after... After several days, uh, uh, it happened that uh, Father Campbell was going to go on a trip and went in there to get his luggage. <laughs> and he found this cat with all the kittens, and, and people were kind of frightened, I guess. But as it turned out, this was his cat, and he was very grateful to Tom and proud for, for uh, finding a home. So that was probably my classic example. And the, uh, just two other things. One was in this very room, climbing up that uh, endless stairway to that podium. The first time I had to read, and I think it was something like a Little Rascal or some ridiculous book like that, and my voice never did project. You know, I, I uh, just never had a, had a hard time getting the hum in my, you know, nasal cat. <laughs> I just never could do it. Now, right now, you know, get, it in the, get it in the bone out of the throat. And so anyway, uh, I'm reading this book about Little Rascal or something, and uh, my knees are shaking, and there are 300 people or whatever in this room, and uh, I got the bell. <laughs> I got the bell, and uh, uh, <laughs> Father said, we can't hear you. And I said, well, oh, okay. Shook a little bit more and kept reading. And I thought I was yelling, I really did, but I, 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 I honestly think that I was yelling. But uh, about two minutes later, I got the bell again, and you never got the bell twice. <laughs> I did. And uh, as a consequence, the rest of you fellas got a two autumn, so. Uh, <laughs> you got a two autumn, and I got a D in speech. <laughs> and two other quick things. One was uh, uh, two of my rivals on the soccer field were uh, were uh, Dennis and Mike, and I remember once uh, uh, panicking when Mike was running after me at midfield, and right in the corner of center field, chopping a, ch uh, a shot with my left foot, and it sailed right into the goalpost. Uh, and I, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, that didn't that didn't yeah, help me. And then the the, this, the the last thing, and I won't say anything more. Was somebody made reference to the earthquake in 56? Uh, Fitzgerald sat in back of me. It was during ge geometry class, and he was always fooling around with my desk. And this desk was going like this, and I was just gonna—I I, was—I'm always—I've always been a pacifist, uh, basically. And I turned around. I was gonna just, just, you know, club him one. And I looked back, and the desk was empty. And then I looked up there, and the tower was going like this. And I looked over here, and Fitzgerald was on the floor. This uh, guy, Gary Anello, is he here? He was here. He was here. He was here. He was here. Well, when I, uh, I went to Reardon for two years, and uh, he used to beat me up, and uh, to, to get away from that, I came into the seminary, and who do I see today? <laughs> him, and, him and Kenneth Pallone, they used to beat me up every day in Reardon High School. Scary, good old Gary. Um, 
I, I want to say one thing I kept thinking today. I tried to talk to as many people as this. I, you know, remember, and you know what, what, it, what I really thought about was the expressions that, you know, for uh, 30 years ago are the same. And I kept, you know, I told a lot of uh, people I've been talking to today that, you know, it's the same expressions that uh, you had then and that you have today. I can just tell, you know, and I thought that was really something. My, my day starts off with Bob Saber. I met him and uh, we walked around. Um, and he carried me through the first couple hours. <laughs> That's not right, funny, is it? But anyway. Um, and then my good friend Chuck here, he told me about how tough I had it. And uh, it was great to hear it, you know? It was like uh, years ago. You know, all that time, and he, he remembers me, and he says how tough I had it, and uh, so anyway, well, I want to say also, uh, I, uh, I'm a policeman in San Francisco, and I'd like to say that, because McLaughlin asked us to, to say what we do. I've been there 21 years, and uh, last thing I want to say is, uh, most people seem real happy today, you know, it's like, uh, it's like life here, and uh, Great. Who are you? What? You can't hear? No. I always can speak loud. I feel Finnegan. Now, you know, the seminary grade gave us a great foundation in our education, right? We learned Latin and English. Uh, one of the things that did, we played soccer, right? So uh, when I went to USF, after I left high school here, I talked to Dr. Donahue. Fitzgerald is up on the fourth floor window and he yells out at him. 
and the man standing behind me with feet even bigger than O'Brien's, and he kicks me. <laughs> and he said something like, I'm lucky that's all he does to me. And I'm standing there transfixed and ready for the next blow, and I'm going to heaven or hell or where. And I go to see Johnny Olivier, and I say, listen, I didn't do anything. And he, what do I do? And the man said, you do nothing and pray. You know? <laughs>
people that made me feel at home here, because of course at the time my family was back in Washington and I was here, and people like Al, Greg, Bob, Conrad, Bob, they all reminded me that there were people out there. And one person that isn't here today that uh, perhaps got me directed, although I've never told him this, he got me directed on the right path to where we're going, was Tom Sheehan. I can always remember looking at Tom and saying, my, that guy knows where he's going. Uh, I don't know if it was, uh, I forget what book it was. See, he was reading some sort of serious <coughs> novel during study hall. I think it was by some revolutionary uh, author, Graham Greene or something. But, you know, at least he always knew where he was going. And I think he was a spirit in this class. I think we all did gain from somebody like Tom. I think uh, maybe the little battle I had with Greg McAllister down in the gym helped a little bit. Uh, no, he never was a good basketball player, even if he didn't think he was. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was even bad at that. I was the only guy that ever put box that I knew in the seminary, and you caused it. <laughs> well, life went on through the seminary crew here. We went off to St. Pat's, and uh, Bob and Jay got the great idea of going to sing up at uh, Bina. And I got the great idea of going off to Mary And I always think of uh, good old Chuck Dillon calling me into his office and saying, what's wrong? You don't like my stereo? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, Chuck was always very good about that. Uh, he sort of liked the fact that I liked chemistry. I never did learn how to make a good bomb, but at least I liked the chemistry. He's a marvelous purple gas. <laughs> very good. And, was it, was it Greg that rolled the ash can down the, uh, or was that at Gaffney? Uh, it was a shot putt. I was thinking it was a shot putt, but uh, that was always good because it stopped outside my door. Thank you. Uh, Ed was also a very good one, and I, I Hated not to mention it. I did stay at his place too. I always tried pushing off of everybody. Thanks for the cigarettes tonight. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, this is a beautiful class. And I think it's something that sort of led me into a, a spiritual development. So once I left St. Patrick's and went into Marinol, I uh, was sort of scandalized until Mike got in Big Red Ed and I went to that. <laughs> but I like institutions. So I left there and went to the Bell System. <laughs> I spent 23 years with the Bell System. Oh, by the way, this is my wife, Carol. I have two lovely children, Stephen and Mary Ann. Um, St. Joseph's has been a, a very fond memory of my, my life. I left <laughs> <laughs> Always looks better looking back. Um, oh, I've been listening to everybody here tonight. A lot of us are slow learners. We, uh, we came to the seminary with the idea of bettering mankind. Fixing injustices, and a lot of us are in social work, hospitals, social services, immigration. Look at Mike over here. We saw a lot of injustice in the world, so let's make some money off of it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Pat. Uh, Pat. <laughs> 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 My 
Professor John O'Neill. John O'Neill. For the first year, I went to him once a week for confession. I had him for Greek. I had him for history. I had him for apologetics. For one year, he called me Mr. Weimer. <laughs> Second year, I had Johnny O. One day he called me Mr. Weimer. Pat Brown handed out the papers. He walks down the aisle, Mr. Weimer. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby was it. I have told my wife these stories. She's heard him tonight, now she starts to believe him. <laughs> I can remember Bob Roger, the tonight, the elegant speaker. Bob Roth. Poetry. He got up and he was supposed to memorize a speech from Shakespeare. And Pop was great on gestures. Bob gets up, and Bob is a little nervous. <laughs> for a year. And he stood there, eloquently speaking, Springs from us! <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I passed on, on Bob down at St. Lucie's Parish in Campbell. I mean, he was cool, calm, collected. Now, this is not the Bob I knew. Uh, 
uh, teacher of the classics, uh, Bucky O'Connor, uh, telling us in his, you know, withering voice, oh, please pay attention to the accents. Oh, tell me, oh, God, you're too polite. I'll have to replace these little guys because they carry out and read the thing by memory for 40 verses or so. And uh, so one, they sort of get even with this really great classicist. It wasn't kind of mean character. You want to get even with a guy like that. Uh, we had the, the, you know, remember the clock that had the second hand that would sweep up at just the precise moment when the, the second hand would sweep around for such such an hour. The, 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 the gig was that whoever was reciting, I can't remember if it was Bob Carroll, it was Tom Sheen, or myself, but when the Tom was reciting. The outline of about 20 pages of the chapter of our history book. One day, and of course only one day, I forgot to do mine, and so I decided to go to a smart class member to find out if if I could borrow his uh, outline, the number one man, number two man I went to uh, was not, were not in, but uh, Greg McAllister was in his room. I borrowed his outline, <laughs> uh, copied it, and sure enough, I was called on that day and read his outline out. And Johnny O says to me, oh, son, what do you think this is, Disneyland? <laughs> came on my door and it was one John Austin said, had I done my outline, you damn right I did my outline. <laughs> could I borrow it? Yes, you could borrow it. Go to class, it was called on John Austin. John Austin read his outline, at which Johnny, and by the way, I got an F. <laughs> the next day, he says to John Austin, looking at me, some people in here could learn from you how to learn how to write a lot line. <laughs> <laughs> I will now skip over to now I'm a vocations director, and Johnny O, before Pope Paul VI was the one that made me a Monsignor, he would write to me and complain about how this place was changing, and I should talk to the bishop, since I was in the bishop's office, about how things were going bad here. Uh, another memory I have is, I think I was present when Charles Dillon, I'm now I was one of the worst students that Charles Dillon ever had. Uh, I'm now trying to get people to come to this place, and Charles Dillon is now up in Seattle, and Charles takes me aside to tell me how much better seminary in Seattle is than this one is, probably because Charles was there. <laughs> At that point, however, Charles learned for the first time, and I wasn't the one that told him, that his other nickname besides Charlie here was God, and he never knew that his it was God. And so uh, Michael McLaughlin at this point could tell us that we would stand around the uh, elevator. When Charles went up the elevator, we would sing Deus Ascendant. <laughs> uh, another, this is much, this evening is much like St. Paul the Corinthians, like love is endless, this is endless. Charlie uh, Dillon was the only one that came back here later. Also, uh, Beansy Campbell came back here later as a regular prof. And he took me aside, let me know how tolerant our class was compared to those who came after us. <laughs> <laughs> Last one was... Uh, Could you be the one right after us? <laughs> the, the first time I came here as a vocational director, I came up that driveway and for better or for worse, I had an upset stomach coming up the driveway, the cause of coming up the driveway. And I went into the president's office and he said, someone is here and you'd probably like to see him. And you haven't seen him in years. And who walks in but Red Ed? Oh. Uh, he wanted to have a job during the summer at that time, so I gave the job. He was not able to meet that job uh, for various reasons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but my educational background took me to instead I'm now a used car salesman. <laughs> Outside of the people who I love all in this room, the most memorable ex uh, exposure I had here was not only having fought a middle moser for two classes, but also as my confessor. And I spent after one confession and 87 rosaries for absolutely nothing the rest of the time here in sin because
which I never confessed on the show. Yeah, here. 